Uh, next, I would like to introduce Dr. Eddie Suarez, who is also one of our Houston Methodist surgeons, whom we spend a lot of time with doing uh, heart and lung transplantation. Thank you, Eddie. Good morning, guys. Thank you very much again. I'm going to be basically talking to you about the actual procedure and what you may be seeing, you know, if you actually are scrubbed in on, on one of these cases. Again, my name is Eddie Suarez. I'm one of the uh, transplant and mechanical device specialists here at Houston Methodist. Uh, Gary already talked about the indications for a lung transplant, the group. Uh, the, the four different groups. It's important for, for you because the different, depending on the indication for the transplant, it's going to change what you're going to see. Someone with COPD or emphysema is going to have a very large chest cavity, usually not too many adhesions, and it's actually a much more straightforward dissection. Someone with pulmonary fibrosis is going to have a much smaller chest cavity. Restrictive lung diseases, your thoracic cavity tends to contract. It makes it a smaller space. You have to watch out for your, to have a smaller donor for those people. They'll be a little bit more uh, more, the, there's a lot more lymphatic tissue, a lot more, uh, blood, many more blood vessels going to the lymph nodes that you're going to have to dissect away, watch for a slightly bloodier surgery, and that's something just to be prepared for. Cystic fibrosis patients are usually younger. People like them because they do well uh, long, long term, and then pulmonary arterial hypertension, a uh, smaller uh, group of people, but they're usually sicker. They have, uh, that their out, outcomes aren't as good, and uh, they usually require you to go on, on, on bypass, not always. But that's something just to kind of think about in the back of your head uh, as you're planning to do the procedure itself. We talked about the contraindications that, that Gary went over. There, are, the main ones are something like they're too sick or they have cancer. Those are the, the main things. If someone has very different um, size lung cavities or some major uh, deformities that can also be a, a contraindication as well. Uh, what? How do you decide whether a donor is actually a good lung? That's another talk. But the most important things are basically that it's exchanging gas when you evaluate it, that the blood gases are adequate, that the, that the PaO2 is usually over 300 when you're on 100% inhaled uh, oxygen. The sizing we talked about is, is well. COPD lungs, you can get a slightly larger lung. Restrictive disease, pulmonary fibrosis lungs, you're going to need to find someone who's a little bit smaller. Uh, you, you, we use height, ma uh, height matching as well as evaluating the size of the uh, lung on chest x-ray as well to, to determine, uh, determine whether the sizing is adequate. And of course, you're going to do the rest of your evaluation, making sure their HLAs are acceptable and so on. We have around six hours to put these lungs in. Once you clamp the lungs or clamp the uh, aorta when you're getting the donor available, you should try to have the pulmonary artery uh, and uh, pulmonary veins unclamped by around six hours. After six hours, you start to see uh, a decent increase in, in, pulmonary, uh, prim in graft dysfunction. That's not to say you're not, someone seven or eight hours afterwards is going to have any issues, but they're going to be at a higher risk of, of having that PGD as well. The uh, most common procedure we do now for double lung is bilateral sequential lung transplants. Before, the only option in the 80s was a heart double lung transplant. People used to do an on-block uh, double lung transplant, which was pretty complicated. Again, had to be on pump. And sometime, I think in the late 80s, Larry Kaiser actually uh, wrote up the bilateral sequential lung transplant at Wash U, where you, which we now do pretty routinely, put in one lung. Uh, take uh, ventilate the, uh, the good lung and switch over to the other side and, and transplant that other lung. Uh, single lung transplants are, are well, we'll talk briefly about that, but uh, um, those people are usually in, in the thoracotic position where you do have exposure to the groins in case you need to go on ECMO. That's really the only major difference to regular posterior lateral thoracotomy. Uh, this is our positioning. Uh, I, we call it the House of Ontario because Gary kind of uh, um, brought the way that he, he liked to do it from the uh, University of Washington. You basically just have those arm boards or the uh, ether screens uh, up on either side of the patient. Arms are up, wrapped around the, the pole so you have full exposure to the chest to perform a, um, a clamshell thoracotomy. Uh, the reason we like to uh, clamshell thoracotomy versus sternotomy usually is just it has the best access to dissect the entire lung. You can really get to the back of the, uh, of the lung uh, th this way. Uh, Off-pump transplantation is the main reason we do it. When you do sternotomy, it's virtually impossible to do an off-pump uh, transplantation. When you do the bilateral clamshell, off-pump does give you lower rates of, of PGD, of, of primary graft dysfunction afterwards. So th th that's the main reason we do it. Uh, it is a larger incision, it could be more painful, and if you do need a concomitant heart procedure, if you need to do a bypass or valve or 
uh, Overso PFO, it's a little bit harder to, to operate through that incision. You can do it, but it's, it's not as straightforward as a, as a sternotomy. And if you know you're going to have to go on pump, a lot of institutions do uh, prefer to go just basically on, on, on pump through a sternotomy. Uh, when you do the uh, thoracotomy, you do bilateral thoracotomies, you can divide the, usually if it's a smaller patient, pulmonary fibrosis, I'll almost always divide the sternum. Some COPDers, they have such a big expansive lung that you can't preserve the sternum. You can just go straight up to the sternum, preserve the mammaries if you can, and, and you have enough visualization that, that uh, you can do the surgery through, through that incision. Um, makes it a little more difficult, but the recovery is a little bit better since you, you have an intact sternum to, to support the thoracic cavity. The level that you're going to go in, we usually go in the fourth, fourth wrist space, but like I said, it depends on the uh, pathology. If someone has COPD, you usually go a little bit lower than someone who has IPF. IPF, when they contracted the, uh, the, the bronchi, take off a little higher up just because you contracted the space, so you usually need to go a little bit higher than, than you think. Um, but like I said, for the most part, when we go into the fourth space, usually it's it's something we can deal with. Uh, I play standard retractors usually at the bit where the uh, ribs bend at the costochondral junction. That's the best place I've noticed to, to place them. Uh, when you get in, you, we dissect the thymus up to the nominate vein and, and uh, open the pericardium if you know you're going to go on pump. If you're not going to go, if you're going to stay off pump, you can just leave everything in, intact. Then uh, we dissect both lungs peripherally. You, you got to see the pulmonary arteries, see the pulmonary veins, and get ties around them and uh, and and go from there, get ready for your pneumonectomy. Uh, when you do your surgery, this is kind of what you're going to be seeing on, on each side. This isn't the best view because the uh, pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein uh, are always going to be right next to each other. They're, they will always be touching. So if you're going around the vein and, and don't see the artery, or if you're going around the artery and you don't see the vein, you don't have the entire artery. You're probably too distal. So something to kind of know that, that if you, you're having to take your scissors and gently tease apart the vein and the artery, you know you're in the, the right spot. Uh, the uh, the things that you're gonna watch out for once you um, once you're getting ready to do the pneumectomy, like Gary said, you will test clamp the PA. So when when you're ready to go on, you you give some heparin, about 100 milligrams uh, per kilo, like uh, Gary noticed. Uh, you clamp the PA, and you're gonna basically look for a patient who's crashing. You see the CVP will be going up, the right heart will distend, the oxygen saturation just drops dramatically because the other lung doesn't doesn't tolerate the single lung ventilation. Any of those issues, you know you're gonna to need to go on pump. Uh, if, if there are no uh, problems there, uh, you can continue with off pump. When you're dissecting the uh, pulmonary artery, the truncus on the right side is always more proximal than you think. You're gonna take this up and uh, under the, the, the superior vena cava to get a clamp across it. Across it. So always go more proximal than, than you think. Um, the left-sided veins, when you start trying to dissect out the superior and inferior veins on, on the left side, you have to pull the heart up and retract it out of the way. And that's when you're, you're going to start anesthesia looking over at you anxiously because the blood pressure is dropping down. So it's something to warn them, hey, the, the pressure is going to go down. Uh, you have to treat the same way you do when uh, off-pump calves, when you have to retract the heart, elevate it up, you know, the pressure goes down. They're going to need to be supported. And you just need to communicate that with your, with your anesthesiologist. Um, if you do have any issues where there's really stuck pulmonary arteries or you, you know, God forbid, tear in, into the pulmonary artery and it's difficult to control, you can always open the, the pericardium and clamp the pulmonary arteries uh, from the inside, assuming they don't have, they're not a redo chest. It, it's usually something that's accessible. The planes are, are clean and you can get around it to, to, con to control it. Um, if it is too difficult to get get around, you're, you're, you've got the pulmonary veins exposed and you, you, you know that the, it's a very friable pulmonary artery with a lot of adhesions, you can wait till the lung is, has arrived. And, and to know that you know, if you tear the lung, you're, you're going to be able to take out that, tear the pulmonary artery, you're going to be able to take out the lung anyway. So just wait, be patient. That's no, no uh, problems with that. Uh, when you have the donor lung, uh, when you've taken out the done your pneumonic and we have the donor lung there, it's it's relatively straightforward to prepare. This is uh, this is more or less what you'll be seeing inside there. This is the uh, back of the heart. This is the uh, left atrial cuff that you're going to basically dissect down the middle. You'll have the right uh, superior and right inferior pulmonary vein along with the left superior and inferior. Give equal amount of tissue to both. You usually have less pulmonary vein than you want. Uh, pulmonary artery you usually have more than you want, so that. That, that's the nice thing with pulmonary artery. You're going to dissect it right down the, the, the raffi. You'll be able to see where, where the separation is between the left and right. You just cut it down the middle. The, um, 
bronchus and the trachea, which you should have both of it. It's going to be surrounded by lymphatic tissue. You'll dissect some out of some of it out of the way. You put the clamp always or, or across the left uh, main stem bronchus, and you cut the left main stem bronchus. The the right upper lobe uh, bronchus usually comes out pretty proximally, and sometimes even comes off the trachea. So just to make sure that you don't injure the upper lobe takeoff, always start off by cutting the the upper left upper lobe uh, main stem bronchus and and. Uh, you can prepare the right from there, just directly looking down the, down the barrel. Um, these double lungs, once you've dissected the donor lungs out, there's no more bronchial arterial circulation. Uh, you try to preserve as much tissue as you can just to kind of prevent any dehiscence, something to cover the uh, urinacemosis with because uh, the, you're not going to have any, any blood supply to, to keep that uh, anastomosis alive. You're going to be depending on the pulmonary arterial circulation. Uh, the other lung you're just going to place on ice while you, while you do your first lung. Uh, when you do your pneumonectomy, you, you give the heparin. We talked about the off-pump dose, 100 units per kilo. If you have to go on-pump, obviously you give a full bypass dose, usually 300 units per kilo. Uh, you clamp the pulmonary artery as, as proximal as you can just to give yourself as much vascular tissue to, to suture as you can. You st you're going to staple the veins. After you clamp the PA, you staple the veins, upper and lower lobe. Go as distal as you can when you, st when you staple the veins. Again, you're trying to give yourself as much vein, as much artery as you can to operate with. Um, when you take out the bronchus, sometimes you have to cut the, the um, bronchus intermedius and the, and the uh, upper lobe bronchus separately. Just make sure you prepare it until you get proximal to the bifurcation. Uh, we've had you know some instances where you, we think that you're you're suturing the the donor to the recipient uh, main stem bronchus. If you haven't taken it right, you could be actually suturing either to the lower lobe or or to the uh, uh, bronchus intermediate. So just make sure you look down the barrel and and you've you've actually taken approximate proximal bifurcation. Uh, when you cut it out, you're going to have usually three little squirting vessels: one on top of the bronchus and two on each corner. Uh, just watch for them. Put little clips on them, or sometimes you can just bovie cauterize them. Uh, and uh, the lymphatics usually what are bleeding back there. So we'll, I'll sometimes take out as much as I can of the level seven packet. Usually, relatively straightforward to take out. Sometimes you need to clip across it and bovie it. But that that'll be the kind of bloodiest section, the lymphatic tissue. So just clean it up before you you suture it, because once you put in the lung, it's it's a little bit more difficult to see that area. So take your time. That's your best visualization once you've done your pneumonectomy. Uh, this is a little bit of what you'll be seeing. This would be a right side pneumonectomy where the bronchus, pulmonary artery, and the left atrium. Uh, this isn't a lung transplant, I'm assuming, because there is no clamp placed across the pulmonary artery, just stapled across. But usually, in, uh, if you were doing the lung transplant, you'd have a clamp on the PA instead of a, a staple line. When you do your bronchial anastomosis, most people use a, use a 3-0 or 4-0 PDS, and you're going to be running the, the posterior membranous section. So starting, I, I like to start right to left. Everyone, it, it's an anastomosis, so however you guys want to do it, some people go left to right. Um, but you just suture this in a, in a running suture. You're going to leave the ends of, of your suture out to, to tie to the uh, interrupteds that you're going to put on the anterior portion of the uh, cartilaginous. Uh, bronchus. Usually use interrupteds on those. I start from the corners to, to make sure you don't have a, uh, a mismatch and uh, go to the center. So I'd start on the right, put interrupteds up till I get to the middle, then start on the left corner, put interrupteds up till you go, get to the middle as well. Uh, if there's a large mismatch in, in, in bronchial sizes, sometimes you, you do need to telescope them. Usually not frequently. frequently. People do try to get um, get a straight end to end anastomosis if possible, but if not, it's usually better to try to get the uh, smaller, usually the, it'll be the recipient, that'll, or the donor that'll be smaller than the recipient, and you can telescope that in a little bit, just take, the, you'll figure it out, but you take some larger bites on one side than, and smaller bites on the other, it'll, it'll pull the bronchus in, in, into, the, uh, into the other one. Uh, next, you're gonna do your pulmonary veins. So the pulmonary veins aren't, for people who aren't aware, you don't, we don't suture them individually, you take a cuff off the left atria. We, put a clamp across the uh, left atrial cuff after you've dissected the pericardium off of it. Uh, when, when you staple across the, the veins, first thing you're going to do is going to kind of cut the pericardium off the veins and, and, ex and expose the intra-pericardial portion of that left atria. You're going to clamp across it, and when you do, you warn your anesthesiologist, because very frequently you're going to have bradycardia that, that the anesthesiologist is going to have to watch out for and, 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 and cover. Um, you want to get as much as you can, but obviously watch for hemodynamics. If you if you make the left atria too small, again, your blood pressure, if you're off pump, will be going too low. So it's a point of communication with the anesthesia as well. Uh, 
for the surgeon, you're gonna tip your, your, your tips are gonna be pointed towards the pulmonary artery, so it's not in your way when you do your pulmonary arterial anastomosis. Uh, you're gonna uh, cut off the staples of your, uh, on your um, upper and lower lobe uh, pulmonary veins, and then just basically uh, take your scissors and, and, and join them together. Uh, it should, like, like see in the picture, you can, it should look like a big, big hole like this that you're gonna suture together with boro or fibro running proline. Uh, this needs to be de-aired, so you're not gonna tie it down. You're gonna leave the sutures loose. Uh, after the, uh, um, finally, the pulmonary artery, it's the, the, your last anastomosis, third anastomosis. Uh, we usually use 6-0 running proline, and it's, it's a big end-to-end -end anastomosis. Nothing really special, except you gotta make sure that it's not twisted. Uh, look down the barrel of your donor uh, pulmonary artery, um, and to make sure that you see where the first bifurcation is, that it's, it's oriented in the right direction, that it's not, it's not twisted. Uh, before you finish that uh, anastomosis, you're gonna tell your anesthesiologist it's time to give steroids uh, before you take off the pulmonary arterial clamp and uh, section out the bronchus to get ready to ventilate the lung. Um, you're, you're gonna slowly uh, take off the clamp on the peroneal artery to, to de-air it. And this is, like we mentioned, this is a point of hypotension that the, the patient's uh, blood volume is gonna be uh, going to his, uh, Half of it's going to be going to, to this new lung and it'll be sucked up. And again, uh, anesthesia you're going to need to cover with usually some press of support. Finally, you de-air the uh, pulmonary artery, atrial cuff, time down, get uh, basic hemostasis. And like we mentioned, when you ventilate, you try to minimize the FiO2 to, to minimize the um, risk of uh, private gra graft dysfunction, whether it, it's actual or not. It's, it's hard to say, but it's what we do. And uh, pain control. Inter intercostal nerve blocks uh, is what we like to do. Some people do epidurals, but just something to think about at, at this point. Um, that's about it. This is what it kind of looks like after you've done one lung. You can see the main differences uh, of, the, uh, of the, this is the head of table down here, foot of the table up above, the anesthesiologist view. Uh, the lung here, interesting enough, isn't going down, so there's a little bit of a, either, uh, there's something kind of, this is an ET tube management. You have a nice new lung, it should be collapsing nicely if it's not, then you have to think about your ET tube placement if there's mucus plugs or, or, or something there. Sometimes it's difficult to control, but as long as you're exchanging oxygen well, it, it's not too big of an issue. But it's interesting, to, you can see how diseased this lung is. It's interesting to note, as diseased it is, you can still do a, a single, uh, you can survive off of this lung while you're, you're implanting this other one. This was done off pump. Uh, that's my presentation.